It all started on one of those typical July afternoons in Coleman, Texas. A hot wind from the panhandle was blowing fine-grained Texas topsoil right through my in-law's house. But despite the heat, we were having what for Coleman was a rip-roaring afternoon of Sunday entertainment. Dominic. Your game, hon. Well, that's another one for Jerry. Shuffle him. Just my luck to get a son-in-law and beat me a domino. <laughs> that young fellow there is me. Right after we were married, my wife Beth and I used to spend two glorious weeks of our summer vacation visiting with her parents. And while we were there, we frequently immersed ourselves in the group dynamics of a good old-fashioned game of dominoes. Later, I went on to study group dynamics of a different sort in all kinds of organizations. What is it so different? The fact is, the more I learn about the way we deal with one another in organizations, the more I'm reminded of that hot Sunday July afternoon in Coleman, Texas, and something I now call the Abilene Paradox. It's 104 degrees. Stay tuned for livestock report. But first, here's a little music. Fifteen. Five. Hey, what do you all say we get in the car and go to Abilene, have supper at the cafeteria? Well, how far away is Abilene? Fifty-three miles. You got the air conditioning that Buick fixed yet? Nope. Well, sounds like a good idea to me. I'd like to go. How about you, Jerry? Yeah, it sounds like a good idea to me. But, but I don't want to go unless your mom wants to go. Oh, well, of course I want to go. <laughs> oh, well, y'all don't think I want to eat leftovers out of the icebox, do you? So... We all piled into the furnace and headed off for Abilene. Some four hours and 106 miles later, after a supper that could have provided first-rate testimonial for antacid, we returned to Coleman. For a long while, there was absolute, teetotal silence. A great trip, wasn't it? Well, to tell the truth, I'd rather have stayed right here. Only y'all hadn't pressured me to go along. What do you mean, y'all? I didn't want to go. I only went along to satisfy the rest of you. You're the culprit. Don't call me a culprit. You and Daddy and Mom are the ones that wanted to go. I just went along to be sociable. Hey, I never wanted to go to Abilene to begin with. I was just making conversation. I didn't know y'all was going to take me up on it and ruin my whole day. It just didn't make sense. Here we were. Four reasonably normal people who took a trip to Abilene we really didn't want to take. You know, though, a lot of other organizations take similar trips. I later came to call it the Abilene Paradox, which is as follows. Organizations frequently take action, 
contrary to the desires of any of their members and defeat the very purposes they set out to achieve. The road to Abilene usually begins like this. Everybody agrees about the basic nature of the situation and what they want to do. I can't believe we went to Abilene when nobody wanted to go. Me neither. Why, I've been just as but happy with leftover But somehow they failed to communicate their agreement. Me too. And based upon such faulty information, they do though. just the opposite. Then why did you suggest we go in the first place? I was just testing the waters. You all took me serious and learned a perfectly good Sunday afternoon. Anger, irritation, frustration. Now, if you folks are wondering if our family ever resolved our conflict, the answer is no. Because strange as it may seem, we were never really in conflict. In fact, the Abilene paradox says it's the inability to manage agreement rather than conflict. It's the single most pressing issue of modern organization, as I learned early on in my career. Just out of school, I got hired as a consultant for an intriguing assignment. So, as I said, production is on a downturn, our profit picture is in transition, none of our staff seems to know why. That's why we brought you in. Any questions? Sounds pretty straightforward. You want me to find out why Acme's profits and productivity are dropping off the charts? <laughs> That's the gist of it. Yes. I sure hope you can pinpoint the problem quick, because we're in real trouble. Well, what's this Project X all about? Oh, an albatross. Those guys down in R&D are trying to turn peanut oil into jet fuel. Don't get me wrong, it looks great on paper. But between you and me, it'll never fly. Why not? The technology just isn't there yet. Have you considered scrapping the project? <laughs> not me. How come? The stockholders. <laughs> they love it. Big spread in the Wall Street Journal on it. Besides, I've got a vice president who has staked her reputation on the success of this project. Well, is she aware of your reservations? Are you kidding? I've got an ulcer myself already. I think I want to give her one. So what do you do? Oh, I go down to her office every few days and say, hang in there, victory or death, stiff upper lip. You know, stuff like that. Isn't that what a president's supposed to do? No, young man, you're barking up the wrong tree. But good luck. <laughs> I decided to find out what the VP thought about Project X. Thank you, Betty. So, you must see a lot of potential in this project to, to stake your career on it, huh? Peanut oil into jet fuel? You've got to be kidding. No, Project X is a dead end street. I don't get it. Why not stop it? You try to stop with the president coming in your office every few days, telling you to hang in there, victory or death, just upper lip and all that type of stuff. So why don't you tell him you think it's a dead-end street? Not me. <laughs> that project is a sacred cow. And besides, I have an R&D director who has staked his reputation on making that project a success. Anyway, those project reports down in R&D are starting to look more optimistic. Who knows? Maybe those people down in R&D can pull a rabbit out of their hat after all. Believe me, it wouldn't be the first time. Maybe the president was right. Maybe I was barking up the wrong tree. I decided to forget Project X and get back to the job I thought I was hired for. So as director of R&D, in your opinion, why do you think Acme's profits are slipping? Did you ever try to turn peanut oil into jet fuel? Stupidest damn idea I've ever heard. VP said all your reports were... Oh, I write those things ambiguously enough so that the board can interpret it any way it pleases. In fact, I sort of uh, slanted towards the positive side, given how committed the brass are to the project. But if the project's unworkable, why don't you tell them? See the woman in that office? Cynthia. Exactly. Rumor has it she was the last person to criticize Project X. Look, I'm middle-aged. I've got two kids in college. I've got alimony payments. There's no job market out there for a guy with my skill. 
Everybody on the board is in favor of this project. Every single day, I've got the president and the vice president down here telling me victory or death, stiff upper lip, hang in there, and all that stuff. I should have seen it then. The culprit wasn't Project X, but rather the company's inability to cope with unanimous agreement that the project was doomed to failure. A few years later, I discovered that the paradox not only applies to corporations, but also to couples. Hello, Professor Harvey. Why do you look so down, Sue? You'd be down, too, if you had to get married Saturday. But George is a great boy. Well, sure he is, but I don't love him. I don't even like him. In fact, I can't stand him. Then why in the world are you marrying him? He gave me an engagement ring. But if you don't love him, don't you think you ought to give it back? I can't do that. Mama loves him. She has a heart condition. If I backed out now, she'd have a heart attack. Besides, there's a room full of presents, and all my bridesmaids have their dresses. I have relatives driving in from Mississippi. The announcements have already gone out to the newspapers. This is a small town. I'd be the laughing stock. I'm not that pretty. I'd never get married. How'd all this happen? Oh, well, you got me. I gave her a ring, and now I'm marrying a girl I don't even love. About two hours later, it was George's turn. If you don't love her, why don't you ask her for it back? No, I can't do that. Oh, if I jilted Sue, it'd kill her. Besides, her mama thinks the world of me. And, you know, then there's all these presents. And... The crazy thing was, Sue and George were in total agreement, but they still seemed determined to spend a lifetime together on the road to Abilene. Anyway, I'm not all that good looking. I may not get another chance if I don't marry Sue. After all, who wants to marry a guy whose fiancé attempted suicide? Now let's go on to item five on the agenda of this meeting on faculty collaboration. I was beginning to realize that nobody's immune to the paradox, and that includes yours truly, a fact that hit home one day while I was in one of those faculty meetings, the kind where nobody really wants to be there. So who's going to kick this one off? You, Professor? Uh, I don't know. Uh, what about team teaching? All right. What do you all say about team teaching? Mrs. Goldblatt would never be able to get it in the fall calendar. Yeah, we tried it at my last school. Teachers would be cutting each other's throats. It would be total confusion to the students. I think the whole idea would be a waste of time. Talk about a waste of time. What was that, Professor Harvey? Oh, I, 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 I said it'd be a waste of time. Team teaching, that is. Well, then I'll entertain a uh, motion to table the team teaching issue until after the afternoon break. I so move. Motion is carried. Now let's move on without further delay to item six on the agenda, policing the faculty lounge. Now, some of the younger faculty Members haven't been signing off their coffee and supplies. You are well aware our budget is very thin. Pretty absurd, isn't it? People taking actions and contradictions to what they really want, and as a result, compounding their problems rather than solving them. Of course, absurdity is an essential element of the Abilene paradox. Whether it's couples, corporations, professors, or even nations, but the big question is why? Now, I've seen a fair number of trips to Abilene and Points West, and I've reached this conclusion. To understand the paradox, we have to come to grips with the psychological principles from which it draws its enormous power. To be or not to be, that is the question. First of all, there's action anxiety, which has been with us since ancient times. By it's epitomized by perhaps the most famous dramatic character of all times, Shakespeare's Hamlet. To sleep for chance to dream. Aye, there's the rub. For in that sleep of death, what dreams... If folks are anxious about which action they wish to take, even though, unlike Hamlet, they may have a perfectly sensible one in mind, 
They may simply refuse to act at all. Thus, conscience does make cowards of us all. To maintain my integrity or to compromise it, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to risk managing a doomed research project. The R&D director's dilemma is not so far removed from that of Hamlet. Both men know exactly what they want to do, but simply can't get cracking. Which makes us spare those jobs we have rather than fly to others we know not of. Thus, unemployment doth make cowards of us all. Second, we often conjure up elaborate negative fantasies of the disasters we're certain will occur if we do act sensibly. But what'll happen if you call it off, Sue? You know what'll happen if I call off this way. No, I don't. Tell me. Well, her mom will keel over and it'll all be my fault. Such dire predictions and give us an ironclad excuse for inaction. Home. When what is really called for is action. Negative fantasy, then, provides a bizarre justification for not taking a risk. How could I face myself in the mirror? Me, a murderer. And I'm only a sophomore. But can we ever really play it safe? So while I agree that we've had some minor... The answer is no. Real risk is a condition of human existence. All our actions have consequences that may well be worse than standing still. As to the matter of the budget for Project X, I feel that we should uh, maintain our current level of financial support. And then you agree that we should continue to fund the project for another year? Absolutely. Uh, so do I. I um, think we may have a real winner. All in favor? But if we're afraid to accept real risk as one of life's givens, we may choose a trip to Abilene instead, a choice that often has far greater risk. So what do we fear? The unknown? A perfect day for golf. Or tennis. You could tell the chairman we need a fourth. I like my job, you tell him. More likely it's something we know rather well. We fear being ostracized. We fear being branded a non-team player. In short, we fear separation. Why don't you move to adjourn? What's the problem, Harvey? No guts? No. No tenure. <laughs> <laughs> but therein lies a paradox within a paradox. Because the more unwilling we are to risk separation, the more likely we are to experience the separation we so fear. Our negative fantasies actually become more real to us than the certain disaster of pursuing what we know is a hopeless course of action. Please be seated. We have gathered here today to join this man and this woman in the immutable bonds of holy matrimony. Formula 6. Four seconds. I don't know what we're going to do. The R&D director refused to risk losing his job by criticizing Project X. Well, can you believe it? We're in the Wall Street Journal again. Great. They saw our names right this time. Yes, unfortunately. But by not voicing his true opinions, he virtually guaranteed the very thing he feared most, being separated, being fired. So far, all we've talked about are the reasons individuals and organizations get on the road to Abilene. Luckily, there are still some ways a costly trip to Abilene can be sidetracked, but you have to be able to spot the road signs. Our research and development is sucking the entire company down. We fail to meet payroll. We're One of the foolproof signs of arrival in Abilene is the search for a scapegoat. I want to know who is responsible. Such assignment of blame is both irrelevant and wasteful. Well, don't look at me. I was relying on those progress reports out of R&D. Because focusing on conflict when agreement is the issue is an act totally devoid of reality. Wait a minute. You're not laying this one off on me. Like heck I'm not. 
I'm removing you from the project. In fact, I'm assigning all of R&D to the vice president until further notice. More important, by the time an organization reaches this point, all its members are victims. If there is anyone present who can show reason why these people should not be joined in the eternal bonds of holy matrimony, let them speak now or forever hold their peace. Do you, George, take this woman's suit for your life? In a sense, all passengers on the Abilene Express conspire with one another to bring about the problem, and all are equally to blame. As long as you both shall live. I do. Do you, Sue, take this man, George? Unless, of course, a way is found to break the grip of such conspiracy. The richer or the poorer, in sickness or in health, as long as you both shall live. Chair, you do it. Chairman called this turkey in the first place. He should stop it. Placing responsibility on the boss is just another form of collusion. In fact, all members are equally responsible. All right, people, let's get started. We table the team. Each of us has a choice. We can remain silent. So now, has anyone any new thoughts on how to collaborate better? Or we can confront the organization. Not with new information, but with what the group already agrees upon. Yes, Professor Harvey. Miss, Mr. Chairman, I don't really want to collaborate with anybody. As a matter of fact, I really don't even want to be at this meeting. But, but I'll stay if that's what the rest of y'all want to do. I'd really be interested in hearing your preferences. Damn. You too. Let's get out of here. Amen. I'll go for that. <laughs> Thank you. So, we can cope with the paradox, but it's not easy. First, each individual has to calculate the real risk of taking action, as well as the risk of taking no action at all. We've cut back on technicians, clerical, Utilities. We've scrapped every non-essential. Then, what is required is I've confrontation in a group setting, but where individuals own up to their own beliefs and feelings, without attributing beliefs and feelings to others. Does anybody else have any bright ideas? I think we should cut Project X. Hear me out. I know I've sung its praises as much as anybody, but I honestly don't believe that Project X is going to work. I think it's a black hole, and nothing is going to come out of it. You know, I think terminating this project could significantly enhance our financial profile. We have a chance, just a chance, of recouping first quarter losses. Do you realize what you're saying? <sighs> yes. Yes, I do. I only wish I had said it earlier. This project has been ill-advised from the start. It could even bankrupt us. Do you mean that you and I and the rest of us have been dragging along a research project that none of us thought would work? It's crazy. I don't know how we did it. Me neither. Let's cancel the damn thing and figure out how we can get going on something productive, like saving this company. The Abilene Paradox. 
You wouldn't think folks could make something so simple as being in agreement into such a problem. But how can we tell when we're on the trail to Abilene? Well, remember our original Abilene. First, everyone agreed about the nature of the situation and what they wanted to do. I can't believe we went to Abilene when nobody wanted to go. Me neither. I'd have been just Second, as happy. They failed to communicate that agreement. Well, me too. Third, they took action contrary to what they really wanted to do. Then why do you suggest we go in the first place? I was just testing the waters. You all took me serious and ruined a perfectly good Sunday afternoon. As a result, everyone experienced anger, frustration, and heck, I think this is where we came in. What well, do you think I wanted to go? I just went because that. Thought you all was getting bored. Bored? Better than getting cooked alive. It's a paradox, all right. But paradoxes are usually such because they're based on a logic, different from what we've come to understand or expect. If we can break that logic and also have the courage of our convictions, our organizations can grow and flourish. I'm going to make an educated guess that you don't have the double six. Domino. I guess I need a mite more education. What do you all say we get in the car, drive up to Amarillo, with some ice cream. 